<clears throat> Let me introduce uh, these uh, scholars. Uh, Robert P. George is a visiting professor at Harvard Law School and the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and director of the James Madison program at Princeton University. He's a member of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom and previously served on the President's Council on Bioethics and as a presidential appointee to the United States. He is a rep recipient of the United States Presidential Citizens Medal and the Honorific Medal for the Defense of Human Rights of the Republic of Poland. He's a prolific author on uh, many topics of importance to our society and uh, in this particular instance to marriage and family. Sharif Gurgis is a PhD student in philosophy at Princeton University and a JD candidate at Yale Law School. After graduating Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude from Princeton where he won prizes for best senior senior thesis in ethics and best thesis in philosophy as well as the Dante Society of America's National Dante Prize he obtained a B.Phil in moral political and legal philosophy from the University of Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. Ryan T. Anderson, Anderson is a William E. Simon a William E. Simon Fellow at the Heritage Foundation and the editor of Public Discourse Ethics, Law, and the Common Good, the online journal of the Witherspoon Institute. A Phi Beta Kappa and Magna Cum Laude graduate of Princeton University, he is a PhD candidate in political philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. His writings have appeared in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, National Review, and the Claremont Review of Books. We're very privileged to have these uh, scholars with us today. Uh, they will speak, I believe, in the order that you see them seated there left to right and then we'll open it for questions. This is being recorded so I would invite you if you are in possession of an electronic device capable of making noise to turn it off to prevent that. Uh, that will be helpful. Let me introduce then Sharif Gurgis. Thanks very much for the introduction. Thanks to everybody for coming. This is a really wonderful and gratifying turnout. And we're looking forward today to discussing the issue of marriage, what it is as a human good, and why the state should be involved in it at all, and then what the harms of redefining marriage in our law are. And I just, before I say my own part in that um, spiel, I want to say a brief word about the kind of argument we're making. Very often you hear arguments, or at least you hear the caricature of the argument for the vision of marriage as a man and a woman as one simply from history. It's always been that way, so it always should be that way. And that's not the kind of argument we're making today. We're not making one from uh, moral condemnation of same-sex relationships either. We think there is a prior question to that of what marriage is. Uh, that would be the same kind of argument and would have the same kind of answer whether the challenge to marriage law today were about same-sex relationships or about some other uh, deviation from the understanding of marriage that we're going to defend. And it's also not a religious argument. And the reason for that is not some secret strategy. It's not simply um, a practical idea that if we used religious arguments, they wouldn't be effective, though certainly in some contexts, they're not as effective as other forms of argument. But because we think there is a pre-theological truth here, or to put it in a different way, that the theological truths about marriage that are common not just to the Christian tradition, but the Jewish and uh, Muslim traditions, and to various, uh, in some Eastern understandings, and even to some non-religious, non-theistic philosophies, reflect something about the human good. In other words, that the reason that God teaches what God has taught, if these traditions are right, is that it reflects the truth about human nature and what makes people live and be well. And that there is even a theological reason to get into those non-theological reasons about marriage. It shows you the wisdom of this law and that it's not just a capricious or despotic sort of uh, decree and it gives you a deeper appreciation for living by them. So that's just a general 
uh, framing of what kind of argument we're going to make. Usually this debate seems like it's settled by a very different framing, which is the framing of it as a matter of equality, simply speaking. Marriage is a good thing. The proposal today is to expand the pool of people eligible to marry. And if you're just faced with a good thing that more people want, equality says you give it to them. In fact, you give it to them on an equal basis. And that framing of the issue seems to settle the debate in the other direction. I think it makes it hard for people with, with good instincts on the issue to articulate a reasoned defense of understanding marriage and enshrining marriage in the law as the union of a man and a woman. And one of the main things we want to get across today is that that is the wrong framing. That is a deep misunderstanding of what the debate is about. It's not about equality. Everybody in the debate believes in human equality, and everybody in the debate believes that marriage, whatever it is, should be recognized on an equal basis. What we disagree about is what marriage is. What we disagree about is when it's a marital relationship that might be going unrecognized under some particular scheme, and when what's not being recognized is something else entirely, which is not just fair not to include as a marriage, but which it's harmful to include as a marriage if there's some social and public value to figuring out what marriage is and to teaching that by the law at all. So what the debate is really about is a competition between two views of that uh, issue, of two visions of what marriage is. And the vision that's on offer in the proposal to redefine marriage today is a vision of marriage mainly as a form of emotional union or companionship. What makes a marriage different from other forms of friendship on this view is its degree of emotional union or intensity or priority. After all, that is what would separate two men who live together and are in love and want to commit to each other and can get a marriage license in New York from two brothers who are committed to sharing the burdens and benefits of common life and to living together indefinitely, but don't have that romantic element and can't therefore get uh, a marriage license in New York, to take just one example. What makes them different is a certain kind of emotional companionship, a romantic or domestic partnership. That's the vision of marriage on offer. And one thing we argue in the book, and that I think we can argue today, again, on terms accessible to everybody, is that that vision of marriage must get marriage wrong. And the way you can see that is that it can't explain other features of marriage that people on both sides of the debate still acknowledge. Take a simple example. The idea that to get off the ground at all, marriage is, has to be pledged to permanence. That idea makes no sense as anything other than an arbitrary restriction, an old hang-up, just a tradition, if what makes a marriage is the emotional union. As long as the emotional union is there, you have a marriage, but as soon as that's gone and it's not something we have direct control over, then so is the marriage. It's reverted to a friendship. We shouldn't pledge permanence as opposed to, say, to be together as long as that emotional union lasts or as long as love lasts, as some people have changed their vows to be. The idea of permanence makes no sense. Sexual exclusivity. If what really makes a marriage is an emotional union or intensity or priority, then Maybe for some people, based on temperament or taste, exclusivity will serve that and foster it. And for some, it won't. Or for some, according to their own understanding, it would do the opposite. And sexual openness in the relationship, an agreement not to be sexually exclusive, would actually foster the emotional union that's what really makes the marriage on this view. So that, too, becomes arbitrary. Permanence and exclusivity. But even monogamy, the idea that marriage is inherently a relationship of two people, that group unions can't make a marriage, makes no sense. If what makes a marriage is a certain shared emotional union plus domestic life, well, three men can have that just as well as two men or a man and a woman. They can have emotional union. They can find most personal fulfillment in the group bond. They can want that to have the same equal social status and dignity. They can want their children reared in this kind of relationship not to be stigmatized. They can want the same tax breaks that are given to monogamy. So permanence, exclusivity, monogamy, even the idea that marriage is a sexual relationship at all ultimately makes no sense on this view. 
because this view says that what makes marriage different is the degree of intensity of emotional union. It would be pretty arbitrary to say that the only way you could have that is in a sexual relationship, that the platonic bond of two sisters who love each other deeply, who commit to a common life, who have the common stock of memories and sympathies that comes from sharing a home, would have something radically different if all that sex is contributing in the other relationship is just emotional union. That's all that the value of sex has on this vision, this alternative vision of marriage. In other words, everything that makes marriage different from deep friendship, from companionship in general, the idea that it's between two, that it has to be pledged to permanence or exclusivity, even that it's a sexual union, makes no sense on this new vision of marriage. And so the vision of marriage must be incorrect, and incorrect by both sides' lights. This is not just something that conservatives are saying. This is not just something that proponents of the conjugal, what we have called the conjugal understanding of marriage say. Increasingly, it's something that's being admitted by the leading proponents of redefining marriage. Um, to give just one um, example, there's a statement called Beyond Marriage that's signed by over 300 LGBT and allied scholars and activists, mainstream people like Judith Stacy, whom Ryan's going to debate in a couple days at NYU, like Cornell West, a colleague and friend of Professor George's, who say, yeah, absolutely, sexual complementarity is arbitrary. It's a hang-up. It's just a tradition. But so is permanence and exclusivity and monogamy and the presumption of sex. And so we should recognize as marriage or the legal equivalent, not just same-sex relationships, but deliberately temporary relationships multiple partner relationships, multiple household relationships, and even non-sexual ones. In other words, they and we agree that on this new vision of marriage, sexual complementarity and everything else that makes marriage different will rise or fall together. And we just disagree on whether they should rise or fall. The next thing you might ask is, okay, if that's wrong, if, that, if it can't just be emotional union, if that collapses marriage into companionship, what's the alternative? Maybe these are just arbitrary restrictions, or they're not arbitrary, but the only way we have of knowing them is, the only way we can give them a coherent unity is from revelation. Uh, and that if it weren't for that revelation, they wouldn't have a unity. But we think that's incorrect. We think revelation is tracking a human good here. And the way that we capture that human good is by the unifying idea of comprehensive union. In other words, we ask what it is that makes any form of union or community at all. And we think it's always common action. It's activity towards common ends in the context of a commitment. And in each of those three ways, the unifying activity, the unifying common ends, and the unifying commitment, the community that makes a marriage is comprehensive. And that this is an idea that's reflected not just in the religious tradition. So let's take the, the first thing, the unifying uh, activity. In other forms of friendship, in other forms of companionship, people are united in heart and mind. They come to know and seek the other person's good. Only in marriage is union comprehensive. Does it include the whole of the other person, of the beloved? That's the, what romantic desire seeks, what, and it finds its fulfillment in the comprehensive union of marriage. But what is comprehensive union in that sense? Well, your person includes your body. The body is a real part of the person. And for that reason, any union that didn't include bodily union wouldn't be comprehensive. And what's bodily union? You can look at the Genesis idea of one flesh union as a very deep, profound abbreviation of this concept. What makes the parts of a single person one flesh, my heart, my lungs, and so on. It's that they're actively coordinated together towards a single end that encompasses them all, which is my biological life. And the remarkable thing about being a human being, in fact, the remarkable thing about being a mammal, is that that deep kind of bodily union, active coordination towards a single end that encompasses them all, is possible between two people, but just in one respect with respect to reproduction. And it's in the, what the law as well as the church has called the marital act, the act that seals or completes a marriage, that a man and a woman become in their bodies, actively coordinated towards a single end, the reproduction of them as a couple. 
So they become, in that respect, truly, and not just metaphorically, one flesh. Comprehensive union in the activity. Comprehensive union with respect to the goods that it's ordered around. So you have different communities ordered around different goods. The community um, that you constitute here is ordered around the good of knowledge. And so it's going to abide by the norms that are required for that, open disclosure, academic integrity, and so on. But the relationship of marriage is not just ordered to this or that good, but to the whole range of goods that comes about in domestic life. Why is that? Well, the very act that makes marital love, on this view, is also the act that makes new life, new human beings, new participants in every aspect of the good. New people who have to be developed not just with respect to their intellectual abilities, but re in terms of recreation and physical health and so on. And so marriage itself, the relationship that's embodied by that act ordered to new life, is as a community ordered to or deepened or enriched by the bearing and rearing of whole new human beings, and therefore to the whole wide sharing of domestic life that's required for bringing those new human beings to maturity. So it's comprehensive in the dimensions of the partners united, including the body. Through that bodily union, it's oriented to or enriched by procreation and therefore all the range of goods. And it's also comprehensive in the commitment that it requires because of those two senses of completeness. It's, if it's really making them one flesh in the marital act and one flesh in the new life that they can bring about together, then it also calls for a comprehensiveness of commitment. And through time, that means permanence. And at each time, that means exclusivity. So here's a view of marriage that makes sense of the idea that it's two, that it's permanent, that it's exclusive, that it's a sexual union, that it has some connection to family life and to the wide sharing of goods, and therefore, as Ryan will tell us, to the common good. It's something that the whole community will take an interest in. And it can explain them without appealing to any specific revelation but with magnificent reflection and summary in key concepts of revelation like one flesh union, concepts that Aristotle and Socrates and Xenophanes and Masonius, Rufus and Plutarch saw just as well as Moses or St. Paul. And it's that vision of marriage which we find across time and place for millennia, basically in every society that we know of before the year 2000 that's being challenged today, not challenged with an expansion, not challenged with the human principle, with the true principle of equality, but challenged with a contender, a different and much watered down vision of marriage that collapses marriage and companionship, that abolishes marriage as its own category at all. Great. Well, thank you, and thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, the policy implications of what Sharif just said. So you could be smiling and nodding along with everything that Sharif just said and then reach the conclusion of who cares? Why does it matter? Uh, why is this something worth uh, advocating for in the public square? Why is the government involved in marriage? Uh, what's the payoff of this? And so I want to begin by considering when government redefined marriage for the second time. And if you want to know when it redefined marriage for the first time, you'll have to ask during the Q&A. So this is something of baiting you for that. But the second time government redefined marriage was with the introduction of no-fault divorce. The expectation of marriage prior to the introduction of no-fault divorce was that marriage was a permanent relationship that could be gotten out of only for grave reasons, which in the common law tradition were listed by the three A's of abuse, abandonment, and adultery. With the introduction of no-fault divorce laws, spouses could now leave, abandon their spouses for any reason or for no reason at all. And this taught something. The law now taught that marriage need not have that expectation of permanency that Sharif talked about. And what we saw was that the law taught, it then taught culture. Culture shaped beliefs and beliefs then influenced action. And we saw that divorce rates rose from the single digits to now approaching 50%. And the first marriage movement the activists who organized in the 80s and the 90s to try to combat the introduction of no-fault divorce laws and the host of social ills that came with this had same-sex relationships nowhere on their radar screen. It had nothing to do with anti-gay animus or homophobia or anything like that. What they were motivated 
by was a vision of marriage, the vision of marriage that Sharif just sketched, and the social goods that that institution provides, how it impacts the common good. And in particular, they were interested in combating the social harms that the re result of the law teaching a false image of what marriage is. And then heterosexuals acting on the basis of bad liberal ideology were causing to the American family in terms of broken hearts and broken homes and in terms of all of the social ills that came with increased single parenting and non-marital childbearing and cohabitation and divorce, sometimes with and sometimes without remarriage. And this is what Maggie Gallagher and David Blankenhorn and the first generation of marriage activists were working on throughout the 80s and the 90s when they wrote books like Fatherless America, Confronting America's Most Urgent Social Problem. And so it was in 2003 that the Massachusetts Supreme Court redefined marriage, now for the, second, or the third time uh, in the nation's history, by eliminating the norm of sexual complementarity. It said it was arbitrary to have marriage law with the expectation that marriage is a union of a man and a woman. And these activists and these scholars had to ask themselves, will redefining marriage to make fathers optional send the message that fathers are essential? That's what we just spent the past 20 years of our lives advocating, writing books in the 80s and the 90s about the importance of fathers. And now the law is going to be teaching that that view is arbitrary, the result of nothing but irrational animus. And that's when they said, we now have to be involved in this second generation of the marriage movement, explaining not only why marriage matters and why it's important, but explaining what marriage is in the first place. And that's how this bled into the second generation of marriage with leaders like Maggie Gallagher and Robbie George. So that asks, raises the question, what social function does marriage play? Sharif gave an explanation, an ontological, a metaphysical, a philosophical account of what marriage is. We can also ask, what does marriage do for a political community? What does marriage do for our society? And in this sense, you can say that marriage exists to bring a man and a woman together as husband and wife to then be mother and father to any children that their union produces. That marriage is about connecting goods and people that otherwise have a natural tendency to fragment. It connects sex with love, husbands with wives, sex with babies, babies with mothers and fathers. That this bundle of goods, this bundle of people, doesn't come together in a permanent and exclusive relationship just by happenstance. It takes strong cultural signals to make this happen. And the law will either strengthen those cultural signals or weaken the cultural signals. The introduction of no-fault divorce law weakened those cultural signals. And we argue in the book and in our other writings that the introduction of genderless marriage, the redefinition of marriage to exclude sexual complementarity, will only go further to weaken those cultural signals. Marriage is based on the truth that men and women are different and complementary. It's based on the uh, biological fact that it takes a man and a woman to produce a child, and it's based on the social reality that children need a mother and a father. And you can ask yourself this question. When a m child is born, a mother will always be close by. That's a matter of biological fact. The question then, will a father be close by, and if so, for how long? And one of the things that the marriage institution does is it maximizes the chance that the father will be committed to that mother, and then the committed mother and father will be taking responsibility for the child. Part of this is based on the truth that there's no such thing as parenting in the abstract. There's mothering and there's fathering, that moms and dads bring different and complementary gifts to the child raising uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, and that one thing that's particularly important is the role that fathers play in the lives of their sons. Uh, if you want to ask yourself a question, which parent is more likely to be wrestling on the living room floor with the son? Teaching the son how to be masculine without being violent, how to be physical without biting or pulling hair or gouging out eyes. In very few cases are you thinking of the mother right now. You're thinking of the father for a reason, because the sexual differences between men and women are real, they're not social constructs. And in particular, when this doesn't happen, we've seen, again, on average, for the most part, that's how social science works, but this is when boys fail to develop into law-abiding, productive members of society that we call men. This is why we saw the rise of crime 
for children who grew up without fathers. That's why we saw the rise of child poverty. That's why we saw the increase in the prison population for children who grew up without fathers. So what marriage does as a social institution, the social function that it performs, is maximizes the chance of protecting the child's right to having the love and the care of the man and the woman, the mother and the father who created the child. We cite various stats in the book that I won't bore you with, but I mean, just as far as like how child, child's development can actually be quantified when uh, uh, compared to other parenting arrangements. The social science that we have has looked at single parenting, cohabitation, divorce and remarriage, and just it's starting to look at same-sex parenting. And the conclusions are rather clear that children do best when raised by their married biological mother and father on a host of indices. Um, even to such a great extent that President Obama himself, back before he evolved on the question of same-sex marriage, uh, gave a speech on fatherhood and he said, we know the statistics that children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and to commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of schools, 20 times more likely to end up in prison. They're more likely to have behavioral problems or run away from home or become teenage parents themselves. And the foundations of our community are weaker because of it. That's what President Obama said in 2008. And that seems in direct tension with what he said in 2012 when he evolved on the marriage question. Given the social function that marriage plays, it can explain why government takes cognizance of marriage in the first place. The state doesn't need to be in the marriage business if marriage is just about my romantic life. If marriage is just about the love life between consenting adults, we can take the government and get it out of the bedroom. The reason government's in the marriage business is because it's the least coercive, least intrusive way of ensuring that children are reared to maturity to be law-abiding, productive members of society. That when this doesn't happen, when the man and the woman who created the child don't commit to each other and then take responsibility for those children, that's when the state grows. That's when we saw the welfare state explode in our nation. The correlation between when the families collapsed and the welfare state exploded is direct. It's also when we saw child poverty rise in our nation. It's when we saw social mobility decrease. It's where we saw crime increase. It's where we saw our prison populations increase. That the marital family, a civil society institution, limits government and it protects a flourishing community by doing the job of raising citizens, raising children, much better than a government program, a midnight basketball program, an after school lunch program, a, a priest, anything like this, anything that's being proposed to pick up the pieces of a shattered marriage culture can do. And it does all of this without criminalizing anything. So in all 50 states, two people of the same sex can live with each other and love each other. They can join a liberal church and have a wedding ceremony performed. They can work for a, an employer who will give them marital benefits. None of this is illegal, none of this is banned. The question now, the question before the Supreme Court right now, is whether or not government will redefine what marriage is and then use the coercive power of the state to force every citizen and every religious community and every business to view a same-sex relationship as the same thing as a marriage. So the rhetoric that you hear from the libertarians about live and let live actually works in the exact opposite direction. The state can let citizens live and let live without redefining marriage, and that's what it's doing. But it has an interest in the marital relationship because this is the relationship that can connect children with their mothers and their fathers. So the last thing I'll say is that what will be some of the harms if we were to redefine marriage right now? I think the first thing to say is that the concern here is not about a small handful of gay or lesbian relationships that will be raising children. That's not the primary concern. The primary concern follows directly from what Sharif talked about, is that which vision of marriage will be promoted through our nation's laws? Will it be a vision of marriage in which marriage is more about your number one person, in the language of John Corvino, one of the philosophers that we um, debate in our book, where it's about your intense emotional union. If that's what marriage is, then it seems that it will further delink the marital relationship from a childbearing, childrearing institution. It'll make marriage more about the desires of adults than about the needs of children. There'll be no institution left in law that would even hold up as an ideal that a child deserves a mother and a father. And in fact, to say that would now be equated through the force of a law with legal bigotry. And so it's not surprising that there are profound religious liberty 
implications for redefining marriage. We've already seen in the state of Massachusetts, the state of Illinois, and the District of Columbia, that Christian adoption agencies have been shut down that wanted to find homes for orphans with married mothers and fathers. The law told them that that was an act of discrimination, that they were discriminating against same-sex couples, and that even religious liberty protections weren't sufficient for this, that the non-discrimination and the rights of LGBT couples trumped their religious liberty rights. And it had nothing to do with government funding either. What was at stake here was simply the license to run an adoption agency. It's illegal to run an adoption agency without a license. The state of Massachusetts, Illinois, and the District of Columbia said, we will not grant you the, marriage, uh, the adoption license unless you place children with same-sex couples on an equal footing with opposite-sex couples. And again, there'll be no public institution, no civic institution left to teach that message. But I think the deepest concern is that the logic that Sharif spelt out that once you eliminate the norm of sexual complementarity, the other three traditional marital norms, monogamy, sexual exclusivity, and the pledge of permanency, become arbitrary. And so you see the activists that Sharif pointed to activizing, activating, agitating in favor of plural marriages, marriages between groups of three or four or more, sexually open marriages, because again, if marriage is about an intense emotional union, sometimes that emotional relationship of the spouses can be enhanced, the argument goes, by having extramarital sexual outlets. The New York Times ran an article about this, interviewing um, Dan Savage, an advice columnist. And then lastly, the Pledge of Permanence. One of the proposals that's coming from the Legal Academy is to make marriage a temporary relationship, like a car lease, that can then be renewed if it's going well. So the expectation would be that it's a temporary, maybe a five-year relationship that can be indefinitely renewed, but it can also just be walked away from after five years if it's not going well, rather than having it be an expectation of permanency. And this will logically follow, we think, once you understand marriage as just an intense emotional relationship. But regardless of what your moral evaluation is of plural marriage or sexually open marriage or temporary marriage, it will be a disaster for the public policy purposes that we as a political society need marriage to serve. Sexually open, sexually plural, temporary relationships between people of the same sex don't have the type of externalities that those relationships have when engaged in by a man and a woman. The more sexual partners I have, the more sexually open my relationships are, the more transient and temporary my relationships are, the more likely that I create fragmented families and fatherless children. That the state's interest in channeling my behavior into a committed, exclusive, permanent relationship that can provide children with a mother and a father is directly undercut if the vision of marriage that the law will now be promoting teaches that it's arbitrary whether you have a monogamous or a polyamorous relationship, whether you have a sexually exclusive or a sexually open, whether you have a permanent or a temporary relationship, that it's all just a matter of lifestyle choice. And that that's the consequence that I, I, I think in particular has the direst warning, because we already see a lot of people living out that ideology. That was the ideology that the sexual revolution brought to fore. And we don't want the law to now teach that that vision of human sexuality, that vision of marriage, is the true vision. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, Professor George will make a few remarks, and then we will take questions. Uh, thank you all, and thank you for being here. Uh, thanks to uh, Richard Williams and Paul Carey and uh, the other members of the faculty who arranged uh, for us to be able to join with you this afternoon to reflect on this profoundly important question of marriage. Uh, I want to say personally what a joy it is for me to be back at Brigham Young University. I believe this is my third, perhaps my uh, fourth visit, and uh, there is no university uh, at the country in, in the country, including Harvard and Princeton, where I teach, where I feel more welcome uh, than I do here at uh, at Brigham Young. So I appreciate you, and I appreciate the uh, warm hospitality uh, and fellowship, uh, spiritual uh, fellowship that I enjoy when I'm at Brigham Young uh, University. Uh, it's also a very great pleasure and honor uh, to be in an LDS community. Uh, my friendships with my LDS uh, friends are among the most valued in my own 
uh, life and my admiration for the church and especially for the witness that the church has given on questions of marriage and family life uh, is really beyond uh, reckoning. Uh, the willingness of LDS people to be active in the marriage cause, to suffer the slings and arrows that come. Uh, I know a bit about that myself, so I know what it's like uh, with standing up for the institution of marriage as properly, soundly, truly uh, understood. Uh, those are admirable qualities, uh, and I salute the entire LDS community from the very leadership of the church that I was privileged again this morning to be able to meet with, uh, down to uh, the faithful LDS people all over the country uh, who have really stood fast to the truth and uh, shown that uh, they are willing to bear the cost, what, what, what Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously called the cost of discipleship. Uh, do people want to know whether Latter-day Saints are really disciples of Jesus Christ? By their fruits, Scripture says you will know them. And by your fruits, you have shown yourself truly, profoundly, in an exemplary manner to be disciples of Christ. Marriage. What an interesting idea. What a great idea. What a profound human good. A good so profound, one might even think that some divine being must have thought the thing up, <laughs> that it's more than merely human. Of course, it is a human reality, a human good, a human institution, one that we believe, my brilliant young co-authors Sharif and Ryan believe, as I do, uh, is pre-political, is, is prior to uh, the state, and even prior to the church. We, we find this in Genesis, in those passages that Sharif quoted, beautiful passages, not merely metaphorical, mind you, Passages that are truly meant literally, that the man and woman shall leave their home and, and cleave to each other and become truly uh, one flesh. Consider this. If human beings did not reproduce sexually by man and woman coming together to create a baby, would anybody have thought up the idea of marriage? No. If human babies, we have a real cute, beautiful baby back there. I love it. <laughs> this is my kind of place. You know what the odds are of me seeing a baby in a Princeton classroom? <laughs> Harvard classroom. But consider that if human babies were born like some shark species, offspring are born, ready to go, ready to rumble, just take off and don't need mom and dad anymore. Would anybody have thought up the idea of marriage? The question answers itself, and it immediately begins to tell you something very important about what marriage is, about the nature of marriage, about the basis of marriage as a human good and a human institution. Marriage really does have something to do with procreation and with child rearing, as Ryan beautifully put it, bringing a man and a woman together as husband and wife to be mother and father to any children that their union is blessed with, conferring on those children the profound blessing of being reared in the bond of mother and father, their very own parents in a family which is itself part of a larger family because they have parents and grandparents and they have siblings and cousins and, and so forth. Marriage is that institution that unites man and woman as mother and father, as, as husband and wife to be mother and father to the children born of their union, giving those children the blessing of being reared with a mom and a dad each making the characteristic and distinctive contributions that men and women make to the enterprise of child rearing. Now I want to reinforce something terribly important that Sharif said. It would be an error, in fact it's a widespread error, to suppose that this is a debate 
based on agreement about what marriage is and only disagreement about who's allowed to participate in the institution. This is the error that virtually suffuses discussion of marriage in the current context and which our book, What is Marriage, was written and titled to combat and we hope to refute because it's a false depiction of what the debate is about. On that false depiction, the way to approach it would simply be to ask, well, what does equality require? And if you have same-sex couples and opposite-sex couples, they seem to be different except for sex. We're not allowed to discriminate based on sex. Bingo, it's over. Why didn't somebody think of that 5,000 years ago? Why did it take us so long? But the truth is that the debate is about what marriage is. The real question is not what does equality require. We all agree on the principle of human equality, the equal worth and dignity of every human being. I only wish, wish my liberal friends really believed it when it came, for example, to the child in the womb or the frail elderly person to be subjected to euthanasia or what have you. But lay that aside. No, we all agree on the profound and inherent dignity of each and every member of the human family, regardless of what experiences or inclinations a person has when it comes to sexuality or anything else. Every human being. We Christians would say, because made in the image and likeness of God, we're bound to recognize the equal dignity of each human being. But the question is, what is marriage? And we will not get one centimeter close to resolving this issue or close to saying what equality or fairness requires unless we answer that question, what is marriage? And here is where there are on offer to you and to your friends and to your generation and to this nation two options. In the book, we refer to them as the conjugal understanding of marriage. That is, the understanding of marriage as a conjugal partnership, the union of husband and wife, and what we call in the book the revisionist understanding of marriage, which depicts marriage as essentially a matter of sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership. On the first view, the conjugal view, marriage is distinctive and set apart from other forms of friendship because it is the form of relationship that is naturally oriented to the having and rearing of children together and would naturally be fulfilled by having and rearing children together. Now notice how I put that because it's terribly important. Would naturally be fulfilled by. This is not a view that supposes that marriage is merely instrumental in its value to procreation and the having and rearing of children as if that were an extrinsic end. Our friends on the other side sometimes depict our view that way. That is false to the actual conjugal view of marriage. And that's because historically, its defenders, and today we its defenders, have always argued that marriage is an intrinsic human good, a basic, irreducible aspect of human well-being, of human thriving, of human fulfillment. It is intrinsically valuable for husband and wife to be in the type of union that is naturally ordered to the coming to be of children and would be naturally fulfilled by having and rearing children together if the union is blessed by children. You can have that and be in that even if the woman is beyond child bearing or conceiving. You can have that if the couple is infertile. That's why historically our law, not only the law of the church, the law of the state as well, has always recognized the marriages of infertile people as valid marriages. Infertility was not a ground even for the declaration of an annulment of marriage, even if the fertility was known and no, infertility was known and known to be permanent. Now by contrast, the law, both church and state, considered that the non-consummation of a marriage by the act that, as Sharif put it, at one and the same time, makes marital love 
and makes new life. The failure of a consummation of marriage was regarded as an impediment or as a ground for the nullification of the marriage. Not divorce, rather a declaration that the marriage had not been completed, had not been perfected, and therefore could be dissolved by way of annulment. That's the conjugal understanding of marriage. And on the basis of that understanding of marriage as an intrinsic human good, linked to procreation but not in the relationship of means to extrinsic end, on that understanding of marriage, we can make sense of all the features of marriage, not only sexual complementarity, which today is in dispute, but even those that, in the case of most people, remain not in dispute. The idea that marriage is a sexual partnership and not some other kind of partnership, like a, a kind of partnership that could uh, just as well be uh, integrated around shared interests or activities like playing tennis together or, or reading novels, sharing an interest in uh, 18th century literature or, or what have you. I mean, think of how odd it would be if, if you met a couple and they said, well, uh, you know, we, we have a sexually open uh, relationship. We don't, that's not sexism, what our marriage is about. Um, but we are really strict about tennis playing. For us, adultery means Sally plays tennis with somebody other than me, Bill. That's adultery for us. Does that sound really odd? It's laughable, right? And that's because we have an understanding behind that laugh. My friend Hadley Arcus says the comedians are the true philosophers. There's an understanding that's behind that laugh that marriage is a sexual partnership. That can be explained on the conjugal view. That marriage is the union of two persons and not three or four more in polyamorous sexual ensembles. Uh, uh, Ryan uh, used the, the phrase plural marriage. Now, in an LDS community, that's probably bringing to the minds of many of you polygamy, or more properly polygyny, as practiced, for example, in the Old Testament by the, by the patriarchs and in the early days of the LDS church. But what we have in mind when Ryan speaks of plural marriage is something much more radical uh, than that. Even in the days of polygamy, each marriage was a conjugal relationship. Henry married to Sally in a marital bond of the conjugal sort. Henry married to Louisa. Henry married to Jill, and so forth. The alternative today is far more radical. It is polyamory, the idea that three or four or five persons can be married together in a sexual partnership where they are all married to each other. It is the antithesis of a conjugal bond. The conjugal understanding of marriage can explain why we have the norm of two-ness. Why three or four or five people in a, conjugal, in a, uh, in a, in a, uh, a polyamorous relationship can't be a true marriage. And as both Sharif and Ryan have explained, the conjugal understanding can make sense of the otherwise inexplicable idea of permanency of marital commitment. Now how about the revisionist view? How about the view that treats marriage as sexual romantic domestic partnership or companionship in which children are merely incidental, a lifestyle choice. You have them if you like them, you don't if you, if you don't. That view simply cannot make sense of any of those other features of marriage, not only sexual complementarity, but permanence, commitment, two-ness rather than three or four or more, uh, uh, closed sexual partnerships rather than open sexual partnerships, even the idea that marriage is a sexual partnership uh, at all. The revisionist understanding can simply make no sense of any of that, except as subjective preferences or sentiments that a particular couple might happen to have, but is of no uh, objective uh, significance. It's just a preference like any other preference, but shouldn't be imposed on anybody who doesn't want it, and shouldn't be favored, for example, by the state over alternative points of view, polyamory, open marriage, and so forth and so on. So you've got to see, and you have to make your interlocutors see when you are witnessing to the good of marriage, that what's at stake here is not simply sexual complementarity. What's at stake here is an entire understanding of marriage with all of its norms on the, uh, on the table. Let me reinforce again what Sharif and Ryan both said about our clear-headed and candid friends on the other side 
making exactly the same point. This is not just Robbie George and Sharif Gerges and Ryan Anderson. It's not just the pro-traditional marriage people. It's the clear-headed and candid people on the other side saying exactly the same thing. So if we look at respected figures like Judith Stacy of NYU, Elizabeth Brake at uh, Arizona State University, uh, uh, Dan Savage, the syndicated columnist, Victoria uh, Brownworth. Uh, we could go on and on with uh, people on the left making this same point. They say, yes, absolutely, of course it's true that what we're after is not simply opening marriage up to more people. We want to fundamentally change the institution by eliminating all of its traditional norms, which they regard as regressive and repressive uh, and restricting of the human personality. That's not a slippery slope argument. I'd be perfectly happy to make a slippery slope argument. I think there is a slippery slope. But notice the nature of the argument that we're making here. When we agree with Dan Savage and Elizabeth Brake and Judith, uh, and Judith Stacy and uh, Victoria Brownworth and uh, all the others, uh, the kind of argument we're making is an argument about the principles that define a reality in an institution as what it is. We're making an argument at the level of principle. The conjugal view can support the principles that define marriage historically. The revisionist view ditches all of those principles. Okay. Well, um, with that, let me close. We're now going to open the floor to questions. So who would like to ask a question? Yes, sir, over here. Do we have, can we bring a microphone down? Um, so thank you once more for coming. And I have a question about what seems to be a um, kind of an unwillingness by many conservatives to, to broach the issue of marriage now and instead back away from that. So there have been public figures such as Bill O'Reilly and Rush Limbaugh who have kind of stepped down from that. And then there are also figures such as, um, I believe it was David Blankenhorn, who used to be in the first marriage movement and now has kind of stepped away and decided that he wants to make allies with those pushing for gay marriage as well. Um, what do you say towards this movement by generally socially conservative people to enshrine what they see as values of marriage but open up the... Uh, I guess the definition, is it just a misunderstanding what's going on there? I want to say get some backbone. You know what's right. Stand up for what you believe in. The other side's tactics have been tactics of intimidation and bullying, depicting their opponents as bigots, as haters. Uh, and people don't like that. Uh, they've also, of course, put people's careers at risk because they have enormous cultural power in the media, in the professions, in academic institutions, and so forth. People fear that if they speak out or speak out too much, they will be targeted uh, and uh, uh, denigrated and degraded and have their careers uh, impeded. People will be made examples of in the old Stalinist uh, uh, methods. Uh, but look, uh, we're talking about here the basic cell of society, the most fundamental institution of human society, on which the welfare of children of communities, of society as a whole, fundamentally rests. The erosion of the marriage culture did not begin with the discussion of same-sex relations. The, 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 what, what, the, the demand for the redefinition of marriage is a symptom, not a cause, of a larger problem that goes back really to figures like Margaret Sanger and her campaign for birth control and free love. Alfred Kinsey and his phony uh, sexology, Hugh Hefner's mainstreaming of, of so-called softcore pornography, the whole 60s me generation, if it feels good, do it, philosophy, the introduction of no-fault divorce, none of which had anything to do with same-sex uh, anything. But the original marriage movement that I joined along with, as a young guy, with the then young Maggie Gallagher and the then young uh, David Blankenhorn, was meant to fight against that stuff because we had seen the consequences beginning in 
inner cities among poor, many, many times minority communities, and then spreading through the country, my native Appalachia, profoundly afflicted by it, where sexual anarchy and out of wedlock childbearing and fatherlessness led to a parade of social pathologies, destroying the lives of people, wounding relationships, breaking people's hearts, landing people in crime and violence and incarceration and drug abuse and jail. We knew that the origins of that were in family breakdown. Daniel Patrick Moynihan told us that in 1965 when I was a little boy in his famous report in which uh, he was ringing the alarm bell because the out of wedlock birth community, uh, birth rate in the black community had reached 25%. And he said what would happen. He told us he was a liberal sociologist from Harvard working for a liberal administration, the Johnson administration, which was designing the Great Society. He did the he ran the numbers. He saw the 25% out of wedlock birth rate in the black community. He said, you know what this means for this community? It means delinquency, despair, drugs, crime, violence, incarceration in a vicious cycle. When Moynihan issued that report, the out of wedlock birth rate in the general population was under 5%. Fast forward to today. Everything Moynihan has said, everything Moynihan predicted came true. You see it, not only in Detroit and Baltimore, but in Harlan County, Kentucky, and in uh, Logan County, West Virginia, where I grew up, near where I grew up, and around the, around the country. The out-of-wedlock birth rate in the African-American community, over 70%. The out-of-wedlock birth rate in the general population, over 40%. Moynihan was ringing the alarm when it was 25% in one sub-community. 40% now in the overall community. 50%, I'm told, in the demographic of women uh, in peak childbearing years between 18 and 35. This is truly catastrophic. This is what, you, you want to fight poverty? Rebuild the marriage culture. And that's what we wanted to do, was to rebuild the marriage culture. And you know what? We were actually making some progress toward that, at least on the academic side. People were beginning to see and even to publish results that revealed that rebuilding the family was essential, that fathers really were necessary <coughs> until the same-sex marriage issue arose. The reason we must prevail on preserving conjugal marriage in our law is not because it's going to solve our problems and put society back together again but only because it means we will be able to live to fight the battle that I got into in the 80s to rebuild the marriage culture. Once we've officially endorsed the idea of marriage as mere sexual romantic companionship and undermined the basis of all marital norms, there is simply no going back. Simply no going back. And the social cost will continue to be paid, not by the affluent and well-educated and well off, but hugely disproportionately by the poor and the vulnerable, in many cases minorities, who liberals who are pushing so hard for same-sex marriage tell us they want to help. Why didn't we, I'll say one final thing on this, why didn't our country hear Daniel Patrick Moynihan in 1965? Why didn't we do something then? He told us what was coming. It should have been pretty clear. Why didn't we care enough about poor people and the people who would become poor because of family breakdown? Why didn't we care about the destruction of the black middle class when Moynihan warned us? Well, some people were afraid of being called racist. Moynihan, was, was, even though a liberal, was, was accused of blaming the victim. But an awful lot of people didn't want to, at the height of the sexual revolution, didn't want to speak the truth about the consequences of sexual immorality and anarchy because it wasn't consistent with the way they lived and the way they wanted to live. And people lost their backbones. They didn't stand up. They didn't want to live right. The result was an essentially an abandonment of the poor and vulnerable. They should have had a backbone. People now should have a backbone. I don't blame people who don't know what's right. I blame people who know what's right and are keeping their mouths shut. You guys can speak for yourselves. Sounds good to me. OK. <laughs> uh, Richard, you have a question uh, there? I have seven questions, man. Okay. So I think we better be faithful to them. Um, let me start with uh, one for Ryan and one for Sharif. Uh, this is addressed to Ryan. Maggie Gallagher explains that marriage is a private promise made in public. 
and by so doing defines the couple's appropriate behavior with each other, but also gives cues to society around them as to how to treat them. Won't or will same-sex marriage bring more confusion to society as to what is appropriate social norms? Yes, yeah. Um, so I mean, the, the, that's the short answer. Uh, the, the last part of the opening remarks that I gave about you know, the consequences of redefining marriage um, was that it would further enshrine in our law the vision of marriage that Sharif had sketched out as more about an emotional relationship between consenting adults, less about the needs of children, more about an emotional relationship that should last as long as the love lasts, not one that's going to be inherently permanent. Uh, and then that further, I think, uh, this is echoes what Professor George just said, that it would call into question why all of the other norms that have traditionally been associated with marriage, monogamy, exclusivity, and permanency, why they should be expectations of adult sexual life. Uh, that redefining marriage to make male and female arbitrary renders everything else about marriage arbitrary. There's nothing magical about the number two. There's nothing magical about sexual exclusivity or permanency. Once you say that the sexual complementarity of spouses and their ability to create children is an arbitrary aspect. Can I just add one thing to that quickly, Richard? Um, there are good people, well-intentioned people, who believe that what will happen if we uh, accept the redefinition of marriage is uh, that it will have the good effect of reducing uh, promiscuity, especially uh, in male homosexual uh, subcultures, uh, so that, that marriage will change behavior uh, rather than marriage being changed uh, in, in, in the process. Uh, there's a word that will be familiar uh, to you, but you're going to be hearing it a lot more if, if, if either through Supreme Court action or the collapse of resistance uh, among Republicans and conservatives lets the, uh, the redefinition of marriage move forward. There's a word you're going to be hearing more and more. It's called heteronormativity. Anybody, everybody heard the word heteronormativity? You're going to be hearing that word a lot. Because suddenly, instead of saying, gee, we need same-sex marriage, we need to redefine marriage in order to have more uh, fidelity in sectors of the culture where you don't have fidelity, what you're going to be hearing is those are heteronormative uh, practices and norms that are being imposed on people and uh, it's unjust and it's unfair and it's a violation of, of equality. Now we have to over having one same-sex marriage, now we have to overcome heteronormativity so we can live marriages our way. This question was related of what about the argument that same-sex marriage will reinvigorate the marriage culture? I think you spoke to that. Yeah, and the, and the, the other general point to make is it's not, there's nothing magical about the label or about imposing the label on a relationship such that as soon as you do, no matter where you impose it, no matter under what conditions, no matter with what expectations, it's going to create a certain kind of behavior. The, way, the reason marriage does matter as a social concept, the way it does work as a kind of encouragement and enforcement is by embodying a vision and a vision that makes sense of these marital norms. Yeah, let, let me encourage everybody, because I don't want you to just take it from us fuddy-duddy old and young conservatives. <laughs> Go to the web. The, the, some, some of you might be on the, on the web right now. If you, if, if you are, I want you to check the price of that stock I bought last week. But uh, <laughs> Go to the web, you can find beyond the statement beyond same-sex marriage. 300 LGBT activists and allies and scholars, uh, including uh, Kenji Yoshino of Yale, uh, Gloria Steinem, the, 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 the famous feminist, Barbara Ehrenreich, and, and others, making exactly this point. Uh, look up the work of Judith Stacy or Elizabeth Brake. Look up Dan Savage. Uh, look up Michelangelo Signorelli. I mean, they, they see it as clearly as we do. This, this is no longer being hidden. Here's a question. In, in this day of relativism, how can one make a position based on truth, right, and wrong be taken seriously? Well, the other side I think has... that was uh, yeah. I think that was a question for the people who are redefining marriage, who are calling other people bigots and demanding equality and justice and using all these moral concepts and speaking in highly moralistic dudgeon. Uh, what effect would changing the definition of marriage have on church marriages, such as weddings in Catholic churches or LDS temples, and so forth? Sure. So as a, the First Amendment, at least how the Obama administration has understood it, entails a freedom to worship. Um, and so the church would be left free to perform sacramental marriages, uh, religious marriages, how the church 
defined that. But as the Obama administration seems to understand the First Amendment and religious liberty, that's about as far as it would extend to protect religious Americans. So it wouldn't extend to your adoption agencies. It wouldn't extend to any businesses that you run. If you're right now, a florist is being sued for not providing flowers for a same-sex wedding. A photographer has been sued for not uh, photographing a same-sex wedding. Innkeepers have been sued for not renting out their bed and breakfasts for same-sex honeymoons. Uh, Knights of Columbus have been sued for not allowing their hall to be used for a reception to a same-sex wedding. Um, if you run a business and you only want to provide marriage benefits to traditionally understood married employees, male and female, you would also see the law coming down against you. So the religious liberty protections should protect more than just the freedom to worship. But the way that we've seen them applied in this administration, if, and if you want to think to the parallel, just look at what's happening right now with health care. Look at how the Obama administration understands religious liberty protections when it comes to mandatory coverage for pills that can induce abortions, contraceptions, and sterilizations. You have the freedom to worship, but if you're going to be faithful in the public square, you have to leave your religion at home. That's how the people who are pushing to redefine marriage also understand what religious liberty entails. So a priest or a minister would never have to marry a same-sex couple on this understanding, but that's about the only religious liberty that would be protected. Yeah, we've seen in other jurisdictions, uh, for example, in uh, Northern Europe, uh, in Canada, uh, actual prohibitions of speech where ministers uh, have been uh, called before human rights commissions or subjected to prosecution simply for preaching from Leviticus, uh, for example. Uh, I don't expect that here. We do have a more robust tradition of, of respect for speech here. However, once members of churches that hold to the conjugal idea of marriage are by law essentially discriminating, then we have all sorts of ways of dealing with people who discriminate. If we're the equivalent of racists, there are ways of dealing with racists, not putting them in jail, not shutting down their speech, but imposing on them all sorts of other civic disabilities in the areas of licensing, like licensing adoption agencies, education, why should Brigham Young University be accredited if its practices are discriminated, uh, discriminating? And in government contracting. Government contracts with religious agencies for all sorts of social services, important, profoundly important social services that churches deliver much better than government itself can, which is why government gives those contracts to churches. Will the LDS, will the Catholics, will the Orthodox Jews be permitted to compete on fair terms? Well, why should they if they are the equivalent of racists? And this isn't just theoretical. Brother Wardle knows the Bob Jones case out of South Carolina in which the Internal Revenue Service revoked the tax status of a private religious university for being racist, for forbidding interracial uh, dating uh, on campus. That will become the precedent for the treatment of all these other religious traditions once those traditions become uh, counted as uh, the equivalent of racist is discriminating. And then there's culture. Think of the disabilities that can be imposed in culture beyond what the law can do. What if you found out that a person that you were considering employing was a member of a racist church, the Church of the Aryan Nation? You likely to employ him? If you happen to be on a, you know, a, a partner in a law firm and you'd like to be on the hiring committee, but they find out you're Catholic or LDS, or it's clear that you're an Orthodox Jew. You can't hide that. You wear your, your, your yarmulke. What if somebody says, well, we can't have that guy on the hiring committee because we have strict anti-discrimination rules and he belongs to a sect that engages in discrimination. The consequences of this are just beginning and they will be profound unless we win marriage. Don't think, please don't think, that we can lose marriage or give up on marriage and retreat to the defense of religious liberty. It won't work. The only way to defend religious liberty is to protect marriage. There's a question here that I think is fair to ask. It says, what valid arguments does the opposition have? Mm -hmm. I think the valid argument, the most valid argument is this. 
look, the conjugal view of marriage is not discriminatory and it's not bigotry in itself. Okay, grant you. It didn't, it arose long before same-sex relations were even an issue. So it can't have been gotten up in order to be mean to homosexually oriented people. However, the conjugal definition of marriage was essentially abolished 50 years ago with no-fault divorce and with the uh, abolition of uh, at least the enforcement of adultery statutes and all sorts of other legal things. Now that you have essentially embodied in law some alternative to the conjugal understanding of marriage, you've got to go to be consistent the whole way and license and recognize same-sex partnerships. You have to yield to the revisionist view because you've already yielded to it at the level of principle going back decades. That's the best argument I can think of, and it's, it's not a bad argument at all. My answer to that argument is you don't get it. Those of us in the marriage movement to protect marriage did not get into this movement to stop same-sex marriage. That wasn't even on the agenda. We got into this movement precisely to roll back the revisionism that had eroded the institution of marriage, producing those horrible consequences that Daniel Patrick Moynihan had had, uh, had uh, uh, warned about. And believe me, if we can prevent marriage from being redefined out of existence, we will be in the forefront of restoring in its fullness and integrity the conjugal definition of marriage by, among other things, going back to a responsible law of child custody and marital dissolution, one that does not make it less meaningful than an ordinary contract, which it, you can, uh, you, you're, at, at least in the case of an ordinary contract, if one party wants to get out of it, he's got to pay some damages. We had a question up here that was related to one of the ones that I had asked a minute ago. And then, in the interest of time, I'm going to summarize three or four of these and move on. Well, it wasn't uh, so much related to, to what you were saying. It was uh, what some of the younger authors were saying. I just uh, want to relate my own experience. I served an LDS mission between 2003 and 2005. And prior to my mission, uh, I was noticing in the pop culture that there wasn't a whole lot of reference to homosexual marriage, not quite yet. But then when I got back, it seemed to have exploded by then. And so my question is a little bit of a strange one. Uh, you had mentioned the ease of, um, under Obamacare, getting access to, um, what, what do you call it, just abortive medi medication and whatnot. And I'm wondering, you, know, you mentioned Margaret Sanger being involved with Planned Parenthood. Do you feel that there may be sort of a eugenic ul ulterior motive behind the, the sudden influx of homosexual marriage in, in the culture and if that is maybe trying to limit the population or something, how, are you aware of no. maybe an esoteric plan to that extent? No, I don't, I don't believe that there's such a thing. You, you don't think uh, that? No. Um, okay. uh, Sanger was a eugenicist. I, I didn't mention that here when I mentioned Sanger, but in the previous uh, meeting we had this afternoon with the Fidelio Society, which you should all join, what a terrific group of young men and women. Um, uh, I did mention that Sanger was a eugenicist. She was quite famous uh, for her eugenics attitudes. She also had some pretty nasty attitudes toward race, appearing at Ku Klux Klan rallies and, 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 and things like that. But she was very influential, nonetheless, in the development of this modern ideology of, uh, of, sexual, of sexual freedom. But no, I, I don't think there's some conspiracy against population or there's any eugenics. Uh, and, and I don't attribute to my friends on the other side, whether they are themselves same-sex attracted or not, any bad will. Uh, in, in the answer to the question I just gave, I, I wanted to, I, try, I tried to articulate a sense of why they think the way they think. I mean, it, it's true that we have largely, at least to a significant extent, maybe not largely, but to a significant extent, already permitted, without much objection, the conjugal understanding of marriage to, to erode. So, so I get why they think what they, they think, but I think it's profoundly wrong and would be tragic. Uh, do you guys see any... Eugenics conspiracy? No. In the interest of time, I think I'm going to move to a couple of these. There are about five of them that essentially the same th say the same thing in terms of what can be done 
Is it too little too late? Uh, how, what's left to save given the state marriage is in? Uh, and uh, what will be the effect, uh, we've dealt with it a little bit, on, on uh, subsequent religious liberties or religion in, in the uh, public discourse? And that may take us to the end of our time here. Sure. Well, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, in, the, in the previous session that there's a post-Christian myth out there. It's a myth that replaces the role that Christianity gives to a divine judge of the living and the dead, to a kingdom where all things are made right, and to the idea of providence that, by which the judge gets you to the kingdom. It's the idea of history as a person, as a judge, and as a source of more than human forces that are going to force us towards some conclusion. And that's the basis of the idea that you don't want to be on the wrong side of history, as if the history the goats are on the left side of history and the sheep are on the right. You don't want to be on the wrong side of history where it's just the idea that a future consensus makes something true. As soon as you describe the view, you don't have to criticize it. It's absurd. It also comes with this idea that we don't have really, at the end of the day, the freedom as a society, much less as individuals, to choose one path over another. Well. History is not a mind of its own. The future is not fixed, it's chosen. And you can choose based on information. So I think it's not at all lost. It's not at all a done deal any more than abortion was a done deal in the 70s and 80s when people said, if you're against it, it's because you're uh, on your deathbed or have a collar around your neck. It's not uh, any more certain than Marxism uh, was certain when in the 70s it looked like that was the future and that it was only going to spread and that at best we might contain it temporarily. Or then the Equal Rights Amendment, which looked like it was as, as certain as any political result. The, what will make it certain is believing that it's certain. Because then the only people that can influence others to choose a different way will be silenced and will be doing nothing. That is a perfect guarantee of a certain result, but it's the only guarantee. Yeah, I, I, I would reinforce that and, and, and just add that if Sharif's right, if, and he plainly is, because the alternative view is absurd, uh, it, it's, it's a view that, that has had an amazing life uh, in, in, in Western culture, but it was invented in the 19th century. Right? I mean, this is not some ancient position, right? Hegel articulates something like it. Marx picks it up from Hegel. And the next thing you know, even people who don't believe themselves, don't con consider themselves Marxists are believing it. Uh, so no, history is open, it's up to us. The key thing that I want to communicate to all of you is do not allow yourselves to be intimidated or bullied into silence. Now, that's not to say that you might not suffer consequences, but you're saints, right? Saints are saints. Saints are people who are prepared to be martyrs. Saints are people who are prepared to pay the cost, however dear it is, of discipleship. Wouldn't ask you to do anything I have not been willing to do myself, but we all need to be willing to do that. The only way it's inevitable is if we permit ourselves to be bullied or intimidated into silence or acquiescence. Just take a minute. So what can be done at the grassroots level among friends? Sure. Colleagues? Well, I mean, the most important thing is just to actually make the argument. It's not that our argument has been heard and been rejected. It's that the vast majority of Americans simply haven't heard our arguments. Um, last week, I was at Chapman Law School, and then Stanford Law School, and then Dickinson, and then I went to NYU, and tomorrow I go to Arizona's Law School, and today we're here at BYU, and then later I go to Chicago and to Florida. And Sharif has been traveling like this, Robbie's traveling like this. There are thousands of college campuses across America, and chances are most students will not be assigned our book. They have not heard the argument, philosophical or sociological, or in, in many cases even theological, for what marriage is and why it matters. And so it's not that we've lost the discussion. It's just that we have to get out and make the argument. And so that's why the Fidelio group here at BYU and the Love and Fidelity Network and these, these um, and if you don't know what it is, these are groups that are uh, springing up on college campuses across America that are organized to equip student leaders to make the argument for a humane and healthy vision of human sexuality, the truth about marriage, 
the truth about chastity, unpopular truths on many college campuses, but once they are one explained and then two lived out, highly attractive truths, that the truth has uh, a splendor to it, especially when embodied, and there's a beauty to it. And so I think you know, the practical thing to say is just start doing something, start doing, making the arguments and living it out. Um, I think the other side, when they talk in terms of inevitability, they have to speak in those terms, and they want the Supreme Court to do their dirty work right now, precisely because they know it's not inevitable. Do you really foresee the state of Utah in any time in your life voting in favor of same-sex marriage? Do you see the state of Alabama, or Georgia, or South Carolina, or Texas, or the vast majority of states aren't going to be voting in favor of same-sex marriage anytime soon, which is why they went to the court to try to get the court to institute a 50-state solution. I think one thing we can be fairly confident of based on the oral arguments is that that outcome is not going to happen. There are not five votes on the court right now to create a constitutional right to same-sex marriage in all 50 states. The court ruling might not go wholly in our favor. Uh, they might strike down a part of the Defense of Marriage Act. They might um, dismiss the Prop 8 case on grounds of standing. But we're not going to get a Roe v. Wade type ruling on marriage, which means we're going to continue having this discussion for years to come. And the question is whether or not we'll each in our own unique way, in the way that our vocation calls for, whether each one of us will bear witness to the truth whether it's living it out, or it's writing books and articles and op-eds, or it's giving lectures on college campuses, or it's talking to our roommates, talking to our friends and family members. In many different ways, we can bear witness to the truth. And I think that's the universal Christian vocation. It's what Christ himself came to do. I was actually just going to pick up the, the last point, that this, the reason there's no, the reason I dodged the question in certain ways is that there's no general answer to it. The answer is what you're, I mean, it's the flip side of having the truly Christian rather than post-Christian vision of how history works. If you think that it's all up to us as a kind of political or social matter, then we have to have a grand plan, a manifesto, a five or 50 year plan to take over. Well, the fact is that we don't. What we're called to is fidelity and fidelity to our vocations. And there are some things that that means for everybody and it's called the moral law which is why the first thing we have to do is make sure we're living by the vision that we hope to um, hold up as a beacon for society. And from there, it just depends. By prayer, by writing, by blogging, by standing up to, for this cause among your, just your circle of friends or more broadly. And the, the example of this is the pro-life movement. The pro-life movement has no single chief who's calling all the shots for everybody, but when everybody followed their vocations, there were crisis pregnancy centers rising up to meet the concrete needs of women in difficult circumstances. There was a legal movement to make sure that originalist under, interpretations of the Constitution uh, eroded the legal and kind of cultural and political foundation for uh, Roe v. Wade. There were uh, intellectual movements to make sure that the argument got made that every human being has intrinsic and equal dignity. And the only way that kind of rich variety of response happens, which is the only way that a victory really does come about, is when people discern their vocation and then do it. I would add to that only this, be bold. Be bold. Now, when I say be bold, I don't mean be reckless. What's the difference between being bold and being reckless? Pretty straightforward. You're reckless when you go into the debate, onto the blogs and letters of editors and the ed to the editor or essays in places where you can get them published where you don't know what you're talking about. You haven't done the homework. You haven't equipped yourself to make the argument. To be bold is to act and not be intimidated into silence when you have done your homework and you understand what's at stake and you know how to make the argument. Uh, what I admire so much about Ryan and Sharif is not only their brilliance, which is obvious, but their boldness. Putting their brilliance to work in the public square, mastering the argument and getting out there to make it. Now, you don't need to have achieved, it's hard to do very quickly, the kind of mastery that Sharif and Ryan have, have achieved in order to be a constructive, contributing person in the debate. There's lots of error out there, poorly reasoned arguments all over the place 
that need to be refuted. Just somebody has to stand up and point out the errors, the mistakes of fact, the logical errors. Someone has to make the case. You can do that. It's not as if you have to have a whole course or spend six weeks buried. Uh, you, you, can, you can read our book in three hours. It's a short and inexpensive uh, book. <laughs> I kind of wish it weren't so inexpensive, but at least make some money out of this same-sex marriage deal. But, but uh, it's short, it's inexpensive. Uh, we think it's quite, uh, it's quite readable. There are other resources, some of which we cite there. So even as you are speaking out, continue to educate yourself, instruct yourself, go to the best uh, sources, learn the art. You'll find in engaging with people, you'll sharpen your wits, you'll sharpen your uh, abilities, you'll sharpen your arguments. Uh, you know, get in touch with us. Uh, if you if the, if you get stuck on 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 something and if you think we can be uh, we can be uh, we can be helpful, uh, I think that there there's no one here, no one in this room, except maybe that little one, and his time will come. There's no one who doesn't have a contribution to make to this cause, and so I can't help but think that it's our duty since we can do it. It's our duty to make that contribution. If it weren't something as important as the institution of marriage at stake, then maybe we could let it slide. But it is the most fundamental unit of society on which every other institution of society depends that's hanging in the balance on this issue. Not just same-sex marriage, but rebuilding a healthy and vibrant marriage culture. So we need to be in the fight. You need to be in the fight. Thank you, Richard.